Welcome to this week's The Jews Are Tired podcast. I'm your host, Lev Gringaus. For regular listeners, you know how this goes. Every once in a while, I'll set aside the podcast, the intro, and the ads, and just launch in to talk about something that's particularly shitty, but something we need to talk about. In this case, after several weeks of high-profile shootings, most notably and Fuck, what a disgusting thing to say about shootings, but that's the world we live in. Most notably at a grocery store in Buffalo, New York, and at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, we have to talk about guns in the U.S., what America's problem is, and unfortunately being real about how nothing is likely to change right now. And yes, I'll also try to cover some of the light at the end of the tunnel so we don't just drown entirely in our misery about this. And yes, I am really angry. And yes, I will be swearing. If you've got a problem with that, stop listening to this episode. Go read the very swear-free research and stories in the podcast notes. If you've only got time to read one thing, let it be the editorial from The Scientific American. On the whole, I try to keep this podcast as a Jewish news podcast focused on, you know, Jewish stuff. So just to state the obvious, I'm talking about guns because guns are an American safety issue. So for the Jews who live here, or who even might just visit here, but who live in the rest of the world, this is our safety issue too. So I want to at least try to get to the point, which is this country could do something about its gun problem, and on paper, a majority of citizens do want to do something. But every time our elected leaders choose not to. And that's obviously about Republicans in Congress obstructing gun safety legislation while Democrats practically sell their kidneys to try and get something done. But more than anything, it's also about the voting system in this country and how it has been engineered to fail us. So let's start with Republicans. And here's where things always get dicey, because no one wants to appear partisan. People love to have this idea of, you know, neutrality, both sides, you know, both sides are equally responsible and are equally able to help solve an issue. But when we default to both sides thinking, we miss the scope and scale of what's happening in reality. How many people I've heard saying, well, Republicans and Democrats just need to get together and compromise and address this issue, but we can't pretend to be civil anymore. We have to cut through the bullshit. Republicans and Democrats aren't equally at fault for not getting stuff done. This is on Republicans because there is no compromise with an extremist party that refuses to address an issue. That's what's going on here. So here's our reality on guns. Factually, objectively, Republican politicians on the whole care more about guns than they do about human life. That's a lesson I learned in 2012, when a shooter walked into Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut and murdered 20 kids and 6 adults. In Connecticut, stricter gun control legislation was passed into law. In several other states, gun regulations were reduced instead, and on a federal level, nothing got done. At the time, there was actually some congressional gun control legislation that was bipartisan, but once it got to the Senate, there just weren't enough Republican votes to break the filibuster and pass it. And I'll actually come back to that in a little bit. But okay, Nothing changed with guns on a federal level. Instead, Republicans told us all the talking points. And they've told us those talking points year after year, mass shooting after mass shooting, while doing nothing about the guns. And the truly horrible thing is that years later, the shooting in Uvalde is the ultimate example of how Republicans have been completely fucking wrong about everything to do with guns. Guns don't kill people, people kill people? Parents in Uvalde had to take a DNA test to identify the remains of their children who had been killed because the force of the bullets from the gun left the bodies of their children mutilated and unidentifiable. A gun did that. Republicans like saying, we've got a mental health problem. That's the, that's the real issue. Setting aside the fact that having mental health issues doesn't mean you're likely to shoot up a school, Republican Governor Greg Abbott in Texas had been defunding mental health programs for years. 
the state is regularly ranked last in the country for access to mental health care, let alone health care, as Texas has the highest number of residents without medical insurance in the country. This is a state led since 1995 by Republicans, so it's blatant hypocrisy for them to go, oh, we have a mental health problem, when they were the ones defunding any help for it. Then we get to, a good guy with a gun will stop a bad guy with a gun. Wow, the police in Uvalde, despite regular trainings that always said to engage any shooter as soon as possible, did nothing to stop the shooter. Even as one child was calling 911 from inside the classroom that the shooter was in, even as that child said on the phone that they were still alive and that they needed police help, the police stood outside of the door and did nothing to stop the shooter for over an hour. Why? You know, it's kind of hard to tell because the police aren't cooperating with the state's investigation about what went wrong. But by all accounts, the police, the supposed good guys with guns, decided it was too dangerous to deal with a guy with an AR-15. On top of that, the police actively stopped the Border Patrol officers from intervening, and the shooter was only killed because the Border Patrol ignored the police. And that's not the first time that a supposed good guy saved themselves instead of the people they were supposed to protect. The same thing happened in Parkland, Florida, on the Valentine's Day shooting at a high school in 2018 when officers with the sheriff's office chose to stay outside of the school instead of going in to do their jobs and engage the shooter. And then we get to gun restrictions, which Republicans tell us will never work. The shooter in Uvalde was an 18-year-old who bought his weapons legally after his birthday in May. Same with the shooter in Buffalo, New York, who targeted a black grocery store. 18 bought his weapons legally. The shooter in Parkland was 19, but also bought his weapons legally. And after passing a required background check, which I'll actually come back to at the end of this episode. Let's combine all of that with some research on school shootings that shows most school shooters were either current students or former students, many of them under the age of 21. So legally, these kids couldn't drink alcohol, couldn't buy cigarettes, but could and did buy a military-grade weapon legally. For the love of God, at least try to make it harder for them. 14-year-olds are getting and drinking alcohol, but we at least try to stop them in the name of public safety. Hell, to their credit, even Florida and Florida Republicans after Parkland actually raised the age to buy rifles to 21. So what's the argument against doing so on a federal level? Well, there is no argument. Republicans are just throwing whatever bullshit they feel like at us to avoid talking about the guns and the easy access to guns. And just to deal with one of the most prominent talking points right now, the conversation has turned to school security. Notwithstanding that Uvalde did implement tighter school security over the past several years, and it all fell apart. But okay, let's talk for just a moment about why increasing school security is a losing game. First of all, remember that factoid about who school shooters tend to be? They are most often current or former students, and former by only a few years at best. So you're talking about kids who most of the time go to school day after day, who blend in, who are supposed to be let into the school. And one day they decide to bring a gun and murder people. How is tighter security supposed to help you against your own students? How far are we willing to go turning schools into jails, suspecting every student as a possible threat before ever stopping to do something about the actual fucking guns and how easy they are to get? Here's another bit of research for you from the same study linked in the podcast notes. School shooters tend to be suicidal, so it's thought that they actually try to target places like schools that have higher security and more guards so that they are more likely to die. The research shows an armed officer doesn't mean fewer deaths in the event of a school shooting. And I'm not even going to 
bother with the idea of arming teachers. My mom is a college professor, and before that, she taught in high school. She is overworked, stressed out, navigating every new curriculum change, plus teaching online during the pandemic. And actual high school teachers right now? They're accused by Republicans of corrupting kids with the gay agenda and critical race theory, alongside being overworked and severely underpaid. You want to give these people guns? I love my mom, but the last fucking thing I need is a neurotic Jewish woman with a gun. Teachers are there to teach, not suspect, and shoot their students. Which finally brings me to the main point. Republicans are bullshitting us. There is no argument or idea they make in good faith. Not one. No idea they propose, unless it's regulating guns and access to guns, is worth engaging with. Sometimes you have to know when to just say, that's bullshit, and walk away. Because those of us who know guns are the problem, we know we know. And the people who have decided guns are fine, let's let people die, they know everything we know too. And if that seems harsh, saying anyone who is against gun regulation is okay with dead kids because they love their guns more, I've got bad news for you. That is exactly what is happening. We can't shy away from it because we want to seem decent or bipartisan anymore. Welcome to reality. Objectively, factually, where Republicans have decided they don't need to do a damn thing about this country's gun problem. Ignore their words. Look at their actions and their votes. They tell the whole story. And just to underline why guns need to be the focus here, gun violence is actually driven by all kinds of factors. A lot of them tend to happen at the same time, like most mass shooters being young white men who have a history of racism, sexism, and violence. But most gun violence actually isn't in the form of mass shootings, it's acts of suicide. And that is driven by any combination of mental health issues and the situation that people and kids find themselves in. And once you start talking about gun violence in the streets, you've got a whole other pile of complicating factors. But all of these different events and factors converge on a common denominator. Guns being used because they're easy to access, either to buy or to take from a parent who thought they locked up their weapon safely. How many times does it need to be said? The United States has more guns than citizens and more gun violence than comparable other countries in the world. The problem is the guns and the ammo and the gun modifications that make the guns deadlier and deadlier. But unfortunately, it's also way more than that. Because the problem is our political and legal system and how it stops gun safety legislation from passing. In the Senate... The filibuster has effectively made most legislation need 60 votes or more to pass. And that's actually why bipartisan gun control legislation failed in 2012 after the Sandy Hook shooting. There were some Republican votes for it in the Senate, and actually some Democratic votes against it too. But the total votes, even if the Democrats had all voted for the legislation, never reached that 60-vote level. So despite being supported by a majority of votes, the legislation failed. Today, Republicans make a habit of obstructing most Democratic legislation with the filibuster. Democrats only have 50 of the Senate's 100 seats, so good luck finding enough Republicans to reach the 60-vote threshold to avoid a filibuster, especially when nearly all of them stick to the party line, which is to do nothing about guns. In some sense, Democrats are also to blame here. If every Democratic senator voted to remove the filibuster, then they could actually pass much-needed legislation. But several Democratic senators aren't on board with removing the filibuster, so that leaves us back where we started with no way to bypass Republican obstructionism, which is the primary reason nothing will get done. The other element at play in the Senate is the basic setup of the institution. On one hand, it's sort of fair. Every state gets two senators. On the other hand, that means Republicans control the other 50 Senate seats, but represent over 40 million fewer Americans than Democrats do with their 50 seats. Which means, in a sense, we have a tyranny of the minority, and a lot of popular legislation can't get passed. Which, again, 
fair on a state level, and there are reasons for this system, but it's arguably anti-democratic for the American public at large. And it's anti-democratic when there are gun safety measures, like expanding background checks and stopping people with a history of mental illness from owning a gun that a majority of both Republican and Democratic voters agree on. But Republicans still won't make an effort to do something about guns. And still, the rot goes deeper. Part of the reason Republicans have kept their voting bloc intact in the Senate and across state politics is because of all they've done to undermine voting rights, specifically the voting rights of non-white Americans who are more likely to vote for Democrats. I'm not going to go into detail on that for this episode, but you can find a link in the podcast notes to a fact sheet from the Brennan Center about Republican voter suppression. Which brings us to the final big issue, which is that Republicans have effectively won. Years of their Senate control and the recent presidency of Donald Trump means that they've gotten their way with arguably the most important part of American democracy, the legal system. There's a conservative majority on the Supreme Court and countless conservative judges that have been appointed at other levels across the country. Only in 2008 did a 5-4 to four conservative majority on the Supreme Court decide there was a constitutional right for individuals to own a gun. In the podcast notes, there's an Atlantic op-ed from former Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, a lifelong conservative and Republican, where he explains how wrong that decision was. But it was made, so it stuck, and it made it harder to enact gun safety restrictions on a state or federal level. And right now, there's a 6-3 to three conservative majority on the Supreme Court. And they recently heard a case about whether or not a New York law restricting conceal and carry licenses should be struck down. Most likely, the court will rule later this summer that the law is unconstitutional, making any other gun control laws similar to it impossible to enact. In other words, it's getting harder and harder to manage what happens with guns in this country, leaving states and Congress with fewer options to do something about our reality of gun violence. Explaining all of this, by the way, is actually an attempt to explain something more basic. Voting alone will not get us out of this mess. For so many people, the default reaction is, you know, if you don't like what the government does, vote new people in. It's about damn time we were honest and recognized the fact that that's not how this works anymore. A vote still has power, But when Republicans work so hard to stop people from voting, collectively we, the American people, have way less power over our government. And when Republicans work to make people think elections are fake and illegitimate if a Democrat wins, that destroys faith in any fair and free elections and the power of the vote. The Republicans have won. So what do we do then? Those of us who know that guns are the problem. Those of us who just want our kids, our siblings, our parents and friends to be safe from gun violence. Do we just call it a day and give up? Fuck no. But we have to strap in for the long ride if things are going to get better. Because Republicans won not over the course of one or two elections. They won over the course of decades of planning of paying for and feeding legal theories they wanted to legal scholars and judges and lawyers. They won by being ruthless and extremist. Now, I'm not advocating we all become extremists. Safety from guns is not an extremist position. It's a fucking normal one. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But the point is, fixing the voting system and thus the political and legal system to one where extremists don't call the shots, that's going to take decades. Decades of, yeah, voting and activism and fighting and protests, just like pretty much every other time this country has been dragged into being a better version of itself, it has taken everything, every kind of fight to move the needle. And I'm not going to pretend like I know every next step we have to take for the next 30 years, but I think we should look to the people who do know how to do this work, who know how to engage government at all levels, who know how to build coalitions with other Americans, and who know that the fight is a long one. Locally for Minnesota Jews, that means looking to organizations like Jewish Community Action, 
the Minnesota chapter of the National Council for Jewish Women, and the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas. By the way, they might not like that I just expressed so much anger on this podcast and sounded so partisan and then pointed listeners to them. And these organizations might not like that I don't always agree with every single policy decision or language choice or statement that each organization puts out. But I don't give a shit. Because making a better country for all of us is better than any one disagreement. So find your local activists and Jewish leaders. Donate to them. Support them. Help them with your time if and when they actually need it, because sometimes the rest of us need to get out of the way instead of clogging up activism with too many cooks in the kitchen. We've got the leaders. We've got the organizations. Listen to them and help them, and do the same for every organization working on expanding voter rights. And again, strap in for the long haul. And here's kind of my last note on all this, and I'm sorry this is running long, but I've got a podcast, so I'm going to get my anger out on it, and I'm both sort of sorry and thankful to any listeners still here for it. But when it comes to the United States, there's obviously a lot to be frustrated about. You know, when it comes to the choices of elected leaders. But the thing that gets me the most is how so many people seem to just kind of go, well, there's nothing we can do. Changing the laws won't stop gun violence. What an absolutely fuck-nuts, anti-American thing to say. At its best, the story of America is a story of not giving up. To go for the example that's closest to home, all those Jews who immigrated here, did we come here to lay down and die and just sort of meh? No. We came here to find and build a better life, and for much of the community, we found it and we built it. Fighting through poverty and anti-Semitism to make our place in this country and doing so by changing laws and policies. We've seen defeat. We saw how this country, driven by white supremacy and racists, shut down immigration in the mid-1920s. That was a policy choice that stranded European Jews and left them to be murdered by Nazis. It took until 1965 for Congress to pass legislation that created a permanent system for admitting refugees to this country, and until the late 1970s to make that system available for all refugees worldwide. So in that sense, we've also seen victories. But these things are fluid. This is stuff that has to be fought for over and over and over again. That's what it takes to protect democracy and what it will take to protect human lives from gun violence and the callous Republican politicians who have decided to do nothing about it. But accepting this attitude that there's nothing we can do, are we Americans or what? We don't just give up. Policy is a choice, and choices make a difference because policy makes a difference. Republicans saying there's nothing we can do about guns? They're anti-American. And any of us who give up like that, we're anti-American too. Here's the last example I'll give. In the Parkland, Florida high school shooting in 2018, the shooter bought his guns legally and also passed a background check. Some might think, well, that proves that background checks don't work. That's that anti-American attitude. If we believe that, then we believe there's nothing we can do. No, the fact that he passed a background check means that we need to make background checks better. And we need to work to make a better gun safety system. That's going to take a long time. But we owe it to all the people, all the kids who will never get to feel another heartbeat because of gun violence. And we owe it to this country not to give up on it. This has been this week's The Jews Are Tired podcast. I'm Lev Gringaus. Don't forget to subscribe and share. And hopefully next week, the Jews will get some rest. The Jews Are Tired is a product of Jewfolk, Inc. For more information, go to tcjewfolk.com or email the show at podcast at tcjewfolk.com. A link to the transcript of this episode is available in the podcast notes, along with links to any news stories or reports referenced for this episode.